Jenny and Amanda. Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you guys? I'm doing great. I'm great. I'm having a great day. What about you, Jenny? I am doing really well. Thank you so much for having us. We're so excited awesome. to be here with you. So, Jenny, let's start with you. Tell us a little oh, bit about yourself and then Amanda, introduce yourself and let us know what you guys do, what you're up to. Do you want to go first? Um, I can. <laughs> so my name is Ginny Oliva Smith, and I am a co-host on a podcast called Soul Rising with Amanda. Um, I also recently uh, just started my own business in rehabbing furniture. I have a company called the Flippin' Phoenix Furniture Rehab, where I take still very well built and beautiful pieces that are headed for a landfill and I upcycle them and find new homes for them. So that's part of, of what we do. Also, while um, being involved with some organizations, being able to donate pieces to people in need, I'm working with a, a battered women's shelter called Gateway um, here in Denver. And I've been providing pieces through the company uh, for them as well. So that's those are the things. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm enjoying summer. This is the first summer that my kids have like had me home in like years and years, their whole life. So yeah. it's pretty awesome. And that's that me. sounds great. And my Amanda, what do you do? So I am Ginny's co-host of the Soul Rising podcast. We started that back in March and we love we love it. We're having so much fun doing it's, that. It, it, I think it's my great. favorite, my favorite part of like. This entire endeavor that I've embarked on with no real destination. I did write a book. My book came out in May. It's called Trust Yourself to Be All In. So I'm an author. I do have a blog. So author, blogger, podcaster. I'm also a mom. I'm also very active in my recovery community. I've been sober a number of years. Um, I co-founded um, a nonprofit called Castle Rock Clubhouse. It's a recovery uh, space, not not a recovery center. It's just a space where we provide meeting space for other 12-step groups. Um, I'm very heavy into uh, meditation, spirituality. Um, I love to, I'm a runner. I like to run. Um, I'm very addicted. I was thinking about you the other day. Was, she's like, tell me about this runner's high debt. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I would love that because I get like nowhere near any kind of runner's high. I just stop. I'm like, mm, never mind. I'm done. Yeah, so I mean, I'm it's a lie. It's a lie. That's it's like, it's, like, it's real. Just tell, <laughs> tell me what. Tell me. It's just that, no. I'm just like I have to just keep running a little further. I'll it's also you know. it's also where I get some time by myself. You know, uh, because I am a mom and it's summertime and very you know kids are demanding and um <laughs> and I also play the drums. I started taking drum lessons about a year and a half ago. My family is very musical. My husband plays guitar and my daughter and. She's 11. She's a lead singer and guitarist in her little kid rock band. It's like amazing. Um, my daughter, my other daughter plays flute. She dances. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. That's what I like to do and what I'm venturing on in this next chapter of my life. So tell us how you all be began working together and doing the podcast together. All of the obstacles you've overcome. You know, simple little question. And just the simple things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a few ways that we know each other. Uh, I also, I had six years um, sober in December of this year. So we know each other in a few different ways. Uh, we also, we've we always gone to the same church too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we became friends in a few different ways. And it was just kind of one of those things where it felt more like family than than friends for sure. Um both of us being in recovery, both of us kind of just on that spiritual hunt, right? That we're all trying to just evolve and become the best versions of ourselves and being able to connect, start connecting with people. You're like, oh, there's other people that are working on this for themselves as well. Um, that's kind of how that started. I think it was sometime during COVID when we had been having a conversation, Amanda and I would just talk about a lot of what was happening in general, which the most obvious thing at that time was just the amount of division that was occurring everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and just this super intense, um, emotionally charged time of people just being divided like we'd never known before. And we were talking, we would talk a lot about that. You know, like, what is this? And what's it going to take? And how are people are just, you have families who are torn apart over like political views on 
what is happening, you know, and questioning that. And uh, I had always, I was, I had told her, I was like, yeah, a podcast would be amazing. You know, this was at one of the times we're hanging out at a coffee shop, like out there, no, at a, we were at Vitality Lunch. Vitality so Lunch, lunch. So I remember yes. that day. Yeah. We were in the sun, we were sitting, we were allowed yeah. to be back together. Was, yeah. I guess outside, six feet apart. And oh. yeah. And Jenny's like, we should just start. We should start a podcast. She, she, you did one, like, randomly. Yeah, on, like, yeah, anchor. Did, like, on the anchor. She's like, look at what I did last night. She goes, anybody could just do a podcast. So she starts playing it for me. The white intro. It was also awesome. Crazy, yeah. So that had been in the back of both of our minds, I think, for a while. And then yeah, sure. um, I just, you know, got inspired in early 2021 about writing my book and all that. And I was like, hey, Jenny, like, do you want to... A little bit of time had passed since yeah. that conversation. And I said, I want to do this podcast. Like, I'm serious about it. Like, will you, you know... We want to do it together. So, yeah, it's done. Yeah. And we both have a very similar energy and, you know, enthusiasm about, well, a lot of things, but specifically about what Jeanine talks about that division and bridging the divide and really talking about the tough stuff, the uncomfortable stuff that people don't really like to talk about because it brings up discomfort and right. humans want comfort. <laughs> all the time on the field good um so yeah so we're both passionate about it and we just started so it started with like my blogs actually because i so after from editing my book i had pulled out so much extra material that i wasn't going to use i had written like a 350 page book and whittled it down to like 210 or i did not know who's that long yeah it was crazy so such a good book by the way you need to go get it go huh. get it thanks <laughs> she's my biggest <laughs> Salesperson, I still, still in sales. sales. I know you left sales, sales, but you're still in sales. Exactly. And um, so taking some of that material, I had repurposed it into blogs. So how we started it was like, okay, let's start with this. I'll put out a blog this Friday, and then like the week after, you know, then we'll put the podcast out. So that's sort of how it's been going. Like every other week, I put out a blog on my website, and then we'll follow it up. We'll talk about it on the podcast. Sometimes it's not exactly uh, related. Yeah, yeah they'll be trying off that. Like I'm not that like. Yeah, there's been times where she's like, Ginny, what do you think? You know, what do you think about this? Like I had done one of the episodes, um, episode Theo on the other side. Yeah. She's like, what do you let's what do we want to talk about? You know, so I kind of just came up with the background of that and we worked that in. So it's been there's been a few times where where there's something happening in life. Yes. And we could be currently in something that's really bringing up challenge or bringing up something that's like uh, that we're trying to grow through. And it's like, hey, maybe we need to like do a show about this, because if I'm going through it, there's a really good chance somebody else is going through it too. And it is uncomfortable. And I know that it's offered me a chance to grow, you know, but it's like, I don't know that we always get the chance to talk to each other about those times. Mm -hmm. We're in most discomfort mm -hmm. and where mm -hmm. these challenging situations are happening. So we've had shows, you know, come from that to just yeah. life events that might be happening right now. Yeah. Well, congratulations to both of you on your sobriety. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. A huge deal. And I wish you both the best. Uh, what uncomfortable did you each have to overcome on your way to sobriety? On your way to sobriety. So my most uncomfortable happened in sobriety, which is kind of interesting because you wouldn't <laughs> think that would be the hardest part of my journey would have been the getting sober part. Right. Um, which to speak to exactly to your question, I think the hardest part was still being around friends um that were still drinking and partying and that was just a way of life i was 26 when i got sober so my friends yeah they were getting married and settling down but you know the weekend barbecues were still happening and there was still a lot of drinking going on around me and i really still in of course in early sobriety you know i wanted to fit in mm -hmm. right like part of an alcoholic trait Overall, I guess you say it's like what you hear a lot of people talk about. Like I didn't fit in. Like I never oh fit God. in. I never fit in as a kid, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so getting sober and being like really different now, like it's just obvious. It's glaring. I don't drink, so now I'm like really separated. Mm -hmm. But still trying to fit in with that world and those people. Um, and it took me probably a couple of years to really kind of say, you know what. I'm just, it's for me, like, I'm just not comfortable in those mm -hmm. situations anymore. Not that I think I'm going to drink. It's not, it wasn't that. It was um, it, different, you know, sobriety carries with it a different um, energy or wavelength or something where 
were seeking just some a little something a little bit different in life than maybe some other people that aren't forced to have to do this work. Like I always say, <laughs> I'm no better than anybody else because I seek a sober spiritual way of life. My life depends on it. All right. the growth I do, it's not like, oh, hey, I'm this really big, brave person. It's like, if I don't look at this stuff and do this, right? So, um, and then I've just become to really kind of addicted to it. It's that. <laughs> Are you surprised? Because I know. Because we never do that. We never change one thing for another. So, Amanda, is it fair to say that you had to, a big struggle in your sobriety was that you had to figure out who you were as a sober person? Yes, 100%. Man. And finding my identity. And that exact, that actually has been <clears throat> the most uncomfortable place for me in sobriety when I've hit these points of intense emotional responses to life. And I've had three major emotional, mental, whatever you want to call it, breakdowns in recovery, where I say I didn't just, you know, hit my knees. I hit, fell to the floor, like took me out. And most of them were surrounding grief. Mm -hmm. um, and in those moments, you know, the biggest one about my identity, I guess I would say, is um, moving. So I was, I'm a New Yorker. I grew mm -hmm. up in New York. No, stop it. We know you guys didn't know. We know you're going to know. Sounded oh. like she's from Canada. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One of my favorite things about her. Okay, go ahead. So 35 years, New Yorker, you know, born and raised in Long Island. I went to school in Love State, New York. I worked in Manhattan. I lived in Brooklyn. So I've been all over um, New York. It's just who I am. And when I moved to Colorado, that was a huge identity crisis for me because I had no idea how much I relied on my New Yorkness or just the familiarity of where I lived and the customs and the culture and the way people act and behave and just everything about the place, right? Um, I had taken on so much of that. And I think maybe that's just human. I think we, we, we root a pl in a place and then it becomes who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and when I moved to Colorado, I was just stripped of all that. I was just this like naked, raw, vulnerable person and it was like who am i and i was nine years sober at the time and i still didn't know who i was i, I and it was it, it that was a very i was here for about a year and then that's when i kind of had a breakdown um and i had to rebuild myself but really not even rebuild what i had but create something new mm -hmm. and i finally was able to say like okay what who are you like what do you really like to do what is really your favorite color? What's really your favorite food? Like simple things like that, right? I had to like figure out and just become comfortable in um, loving myself enough and feeling enough self-worth to say, yeah, those things are valuable. You're, you're valuable because of who you are, not because you're trying to be like that person or this person or that person, but because of who Amanda is and your spirit. And then, you know, my character, who do I, who do I, who do I want to be? I wasn't even the things that I wanted to be yet. Right. It was like, well, I really want to be like compassionate. Yes. I really want to be a woman of grace and of love. And I want people to feel comfortable when they're around me. You know, like I was able to like totally redefine myself. So it was so painful, but such a blessing. Mm -hmm. Like that's the only way I grow is through pain. Sure. And Jenny, what about you? What was your big uncomfortable in your journey to sobriety? Oh, my gosh. Um, there was so much uncomfortable. But I think um, never being in that big of a place of shame, I think, and also um, just being in that spot of realizing and coming to a realization that you need to ask for help. Like this thought of, I, have, I can't do this by myself. Like, I can't do this. And I was someone who, you know, in the, in the parts where I really became like unwell with my drinking, it was all managing anxiety, like every bit of it, all of it, you know? So it's like coming to this realization and, and the, um, I don't know, just that place where you can go. You're so far from yourself or the person that you, well, like we're talking about, I, I had to come to realize too, I didn't truly know a huge part of who I was either, you know, cause it was always such a, um, an, anest an anesthetic that I have, like it was something I could always use to just quiet that brain, or so I thought, right? Quiet the brain down, calm the anxiety, feel cool around other people, like not feel like an outsider, mm -hmm. not feel like I don't fit. Um, 
yeah, so come to this realization and 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 uh, acceptance of that part where you're the, you used to be the person. This happens to a lot of people. Not not this didn't just happen to me. I mean, I'm I never missed a day of work. I never, you know, I was a mom. There was a lot of people I I look at now. And it's like, ugh, you know, you you put people in danger. But I wasn't like someone under the bridge, like with a paper bag. I was like doing well and all the things. So it's not always. It's not always a person who you think that might be struggling with addiction or alcoholism. And I was definitely one of those people where, but towards the end of it, there was just a lot of hiding and no one really knew how much I was using it to like manage my own anxiety and being able to just function. Um, so coming to that realization and acceptance of like, I can't do this by myself. Um, the sh that shame wall you build because you, you don't want to be in that position. Like you don't, you as angry as somebody could be at you, you're 10 times more disgusted. Like mm. every day when you're at that point where it gets that bad. Mm -hmm. So um, that and then, yeah, just that super unaligned distance from myself. You know, it was like that was super challenging. That was almost a scary thing because you're almost you're you don't remember who you were or who you you don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And yeah, having that whole thing of who am I going to be without this um synthetic armor that I've had like it wasn't really armor but it sure I was convinced it was yeah. you know and there were times where it did work that way so to know that I that armor was not going to be there anymore was like that was a and to be accepting of that of like all right well let's we're probably gonna have to feel some things and dig down and you know face some things that's the other part of it I think still that's still a challenge for me you know I'm six years like I said going at six years in December and I'm just last week, I had this event where I just had stuff pulled out of me like I thought was healed. I'm like, that is good. Yeah. Um, so over it. Meanwhile, a fast forward of a whole cradle crying like, what is this? You know, all this pain that I didn't know was there. So I think, um, yeah, that balance of uh finding the courage or, or trying still or having to figure out how you're going to find courage to continue to dig down deep inside and not be afraid to keep working through the things that have caused us trauma or pain in our lives prior to this so yeah i think it was it was all of that <laughs> wow you know i'm pretty close with someone who gave up smoking and that's a much different experience than becoming sober for sure um, but this person expressed that it wasn't just getting over the nicotine, but it was the ways that smoking functioned in her life. It was an excuse to step outside and just get a breather, to get away from whomever, whatever situation and grab a few minutes by herself. It was one of those ways that she, um, she said when she quit smoking, she had to figure out how to define boundaries, how to guard her space and herself in a new way, because she never had done that before. She would just always step out and get a cigarette when things got yes. uncomfortable. So yes. what I see in her story and, and what both of you are saying is that so many times that anxiety comes up and it's all about identity. Who are we? Exactly. And how do we stay in our skin in mm -hmm. the company we're in or in the place that mm -hmm. we're in in the moment? Yes, exactly. Like Ginny used the word anesthetize. Like that's exactly what it was. It was they call it like a social lubricant. Yeah. Now, you know, I can go to those if I have a good reason for being there and I really want to be the celebrate, you know, go to the barbecue or go to the place. Like I don't shield myself or hide from place where there's alcohol if I have a good reason for being there. So now, yes, redefining who I am and showing up as my true self because I don't have that mask hiding behind the alcohol, you yeah. know, because I just, yeah, it, it's, it's crazy to think about that, like who I was then in those situations and then who I am. Mm -hmm. What a, what a blessing recovery is. It's really, it really is. I was going to mention too. I've heard from many people, right, and all of us, for whatever our addiction is, it's all like dopamine related, right? All of us on that dopamine hunt. And I have heard that nicotine is actually, it might be single-handedly like the hardest thing to quit. So even though alcohol is different, that. I have heard it's harder to kick nicotine than it is heroin. So wow. your friends, yeah, 
It, it just doesn't. I heard that too. Yeah. It, they, you just don't have the same, um, you know, for us, like, oh, those of us that it was alcohol, you know, people you knew when we were too drunk and with cigarettes, it's like, it's never going to change any of the situation, like, as it's yeah. happening. Yeah. So you're able to do it more. So you're, the physical addiction of it, I've heard, is relentless. So for your friend to do that, it's incredible. It's amazing. So for anyone out there who is struggling with this, um, one, feel seen, truly yeah. seen, because what you're doing is so hard. It's so flipping hard because of the chemical stuff that's happening, but also the emotional and spiritual stuff that is happening that you have to rebuild and redefine and reconstruct in this journey. Totally. Totally. And you can do it. And yes. it's out there. If we can do it, you can do it. Believe me. Yeah. I'm all, we're going to die. Yeah. 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 If we can do it, you can do it. It's but not, it's also, it's like never alone. You know, it's not something to do alone. And then also just to have a lot of hope about, Getting to know who the person is that you are was exciting. It is exciting. And and there is there is something even bigger about that of finally being like, oh, so this is who I am. Yeah. So yeah. And and it's a happy life. It's a joyful life and it's way more fulfilled. So keep at it, any mm -hmm. of you out there listening, like, because it's definitely worth it. And you're not alone. For yeah. sure. And you keep growing through the whole process. Mm -hmm. Like when I stopped uh drinking the same week I started running. Like, that's when I became a runner, right? And then I started slowly, like, oh, I think I might like to bake. I started baking, right? <laughs> oh, I think I love flowers. Maybe I should try gardening. Then yeah. I added in, you know, so I just, who I am today took a long time to culminate. And then there's still so much more, right? Oh, yeah. And then once you do one thing and you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I could do that. I, you know, I have enough confidence in myself that I could try that thing. Right. Um, and then that's like a reference for the next thing you say, like, I just started drum lessons a year and a half ago. You know, I, I've been sober a while. It took me that long to say, mm -hmm. like, I think I might be able to do this, you know, or at least just try it. Just have She's the courage good. to try it. Don't let her talk it down. She's good at it. <laughs> she can keep her beat. <laughs> She's good. So, yeah. Yeah. You guys could do it out there. Totally. And you could reach out to us, too, after Absolutely. the show. I'm sure Melissa will put the info in the whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. And for sure, there are going to be links in the show notes to your book, to your podcast, to your website. Oh, all thank, of you. It. thank you. Thank you. Um, what is giving you life right now? Jenny, I'll ask you first. What is giving me life right now? Um, starting this new venture of starting this business on my own is definitely giving me a ton of new life. Um, just because I'm feeling like I'm doing something, I'm feeling um, fulfilled in the sense that I, my time, I feel like I'm using my time well with a gift I didn't know that I had, you know, it was just, or would enjoy it as much as I do. It's just, we, you know, bringing, bringing furniture back to life, but I'm really getting to understand and appreciate and be a part of some of these organizations of people that are that second chance concept, that idea that uh, we all deserve a second chance. Everything deserves a second chance. An old piece of furniture deserves a second chance. And I think I, I think I found a lot of healing and a lot of therapy in doing furniture because it reminds me a lot of me. It reminds me a lot mm. of every recovering addict or alcoholic I know because they're some of the greatest people I've ever known in life ever could trust them with anything they're strong they're built well you can count on them but we all go through some of these stages sometimes where our exterior is you know it's not our best however it's not defining who we are underneath so you find these old pieces of furniture that people are like oh it's so scratched on the top and it's so oh, like i can't even take it anymore you know like just pick it up it's going to the dump and it's you know some like mid-century modern 1967 dresser that is built better the bones of it are stronger and built better than anything that would come out now. It just needs some rehab. It needs some help. It needs some attention uh, to bring it back to that. So stepping away, I've, I've worked in sales. I was in the corporate world for 18 years, you know, and it was kind of a big jump, a big leap. And it's an adventure, but I definitely feel myself growing. And I feel it's for the first time ever, I feel like my days are being spent in a way where I'm around more for my kids, where I might be leaving something here on this earth that's not just for me, you know, maybe something decent, something good, 
um, and helping, just serving others and, and, and showing up to be myself. You know, again, I think it's probably, I'm somebody who I'm an introvert, kind of not really. I'm an extrovert, like crazy, but I'm like, I don't even know what they call that. When you're like an extrovert and introvert, there's times since being sober, I've realized I do need my alone time. Like I'm like, Ugh. and I've never felt more, I guess, comfortable in my skin than I have sitting in a garage and just painting quietly, listening to music. I'm generally a very like, I don't know, you know, out there interacting with people person. And I felt like I was finally at a calm spot, you know, doing painting furniture, bringing it back to life. So I'm grateful for that. That's bringing me life because I'm in my mid 40s and I didn't think I'd find a passion for something like that that could potentially change the trajectory, you know, of my path altogether. Like I'm not in traffic. I'm not driving, you know, to downtown Denver, like in rush hour and just crazy. I don't know. Busy, busy, insane all the time. Like I'm, I feel like I'm living a little more life. Um, and my perspective on things has just shifted with that. We've had some losses in our family recently of really great people. And that has also helped to shift that just reevaluation of what's important and, you know, the time we have and how we spend it and dealing with the wounds we have so they don't interfere with the time we have. Mm -hmm. And yeah, those are, that's, for, I would say that those are the things bringing me life uh, right now. Beautiful. Journey. I love how the light, you guys see the lights coming out of the top of <laughs> Do you guys like that special effect? Like, I'll just like this. Love it. Oh, yes, and you right. wait hours to make sure that happened, right? Yes. Yes. So, Amanda, what's giving you life right now? Um, well, definitely my my book and when um, the people really feel the message and they're uh, reaching out to me and telling me um, how much it, you know, means to them that they see themselves in my story, that it's giving them the courage to deal with some of the issues that they've just kind of been pushing under the rug for years. And they're saying, I think it's time now to look at this. Um, and that like I'm providing guidance and a path forward in a non-scary way. Like it's not so intimidating. It's like, this is available and accessible for you if you want this healing. You know? um, and more so than just like the, my friends and people that are reaching out, it's their, their kids. Like um, I had a book launch party a couple of weeks ago here in Colorado. And uh, like two days later, my friend texted me. She goes, you know, I was in the car. I was having like a really rough day. She struggles with some mental illness stuff. She goes, it's a really rough day. She goes, and my son, he's like maybe nine or 10. <laughs> he said, mom, we'll be spending the rest of our lives protecting your fragile. <laughs> Go. No. Where did you hear that? And he said, "Amanda, <laughs> I love that." <laughs> I was like, "When did I even say and that?" I, yeah, like, I as I was talking, I guess I said something along those lines. I don't know. I love it. And then another friend's daughter is like, "I want to be a writer like you when I grow up, Miss Amanda." <laughs> you know, and it's like I could never imagine in a million yeah. years that like anybody would want to emulate who I who I used to be right yeah so now it's like just coming into this next chapter of birthing a new yeah Amanda and like right because our experiences shape us and, and all that so that gives me like definitely new life and then I feel like I'm I just recently did some, I do the hypnotherapy. It's called rapid resolution therapy and it's extremely um like helpful and efficient like the word because it's three sessions it's rapid resolution and it rewires your neural pathways so that is extremely um potent beneficial for trauma especially because trauma we know is lodged in the brain mm -hmm. and talking about trauma and reliving trauma does not heal trauma um so i've been doing some of that i did some on my grief on the traumatic the the loss of my brother was very traumatic he overdosed mm -hmm. on drugs five years ago and i got that call and I didn't realize up until like a year or two ago, like how much that really affected me. So I did some work around that. And then recently I just went back in to do some of that around my sexual trauma that I had as a kid. So I walked out of that appointment, like so free. Like I was crying on the way home. I called my husband. I was like, I have never felt more free in my life. Like I'm shedding, I'm shedding, right? I'm shedding all these things and it's all 
because also now I have to show up. Like what I say in that book has to be true, right? Like I have to live with integrity. And if, and I never, ever claim to say that I have any of this stuff licked. It's a constant work in progress, yeah. right? And I don't have all your answers. And I definitely, I say it numerous times, I'm still growing and learning with you. Um, but if I say I'm doing that, I have to continue learning and growing with you, right? right? And looking right. at this stuff when it comes up. So uh, I recently did that. And I felt like a new person after that. Um, and, you know, to maintain it, I have to do my meditation and I have to, do, I have to run and I have to go to, you know, I go to AA meetings and I have to like do stuff that like keeps prayer. Like I have to do all the stuff or else it really quickly. I don't know if it's the addict's brain. I don't know what it is, but it very quickly goes away. So I have to, if I want to keep that new life, that sense of rebirth, of optimism, of hope, of healing, I have to practice these things like every single day. And that's how I, I, may, I maintain that new sense of new life. So what message would you like to leave the listeners with today? Hmm. I don't know. I would say, um, first of all, that in any situation or any phase of growth that anyone's in, just know there's someone else that's probably very familiar with it as you're in it or someone who's been through it. And that, building these connections again with one another is going to be super amazing for all of us to be able to continue to grow. Um, and to maybe even when it's a little bit uncomfortable, you know, let ourselves be vulnerable to make those connections with people. We've become, we've had a few years of being physically separate of being emotionally separate and politically separate and all of being separate. So like give yourself some permission to be vulnerable and make those connections again with people, even if it's like, you know, this amazing podcast and communities like this. There's a bunch of us out there. And yeah, we're all in it together. I would also add to that um, healing is possible. Mm -hmm. You know, like we are constant work in progress. And I look at it like a spectrum, right? Like I started out here, you know, those years ago when I got sober. You know, like I'm a little bit more in the spectrum and I can acknowledge that and appreciate that mm -hmm. and feel that sense of, um, achievement or fulfillment right and say you know when i i like i'm okay like i am okay i always want to strive and be a little bit better but right now i'm okay and you're okay exactly the way you are there is absolutely nothing wrong with you there might be messages telling you that there are old messages childhood wounds and all that kind of stuff that the tapes are playing that, that you need to stay stuck or you need to stay in pain that's not true. I want to tell you that that's not true. Mm -hmm. And that healing is possible. And like Ginny said, there are, I mean, we're living in a time now where healing is just so, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just possible, but um, right. 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 Like, yeah. like it's okay. Like therapy is yeah. no longer this big, like taboo thing, you know, like it's available to you. It's mm -hmm. encouraged. That's the word. Healing is encouraged today. So take advantage of that. And, uh, Again, like we're we're here for you too, but there's plenty of organizations, doctors, you know, professionals, groups that are there, whether it's grief therapy or it's quitting smoking or it's mm -hmm. whatever you've drugs. gone through, sexual abuse, whatever it is that you've gone through. There are, like Jeannie said, people who want to help you. Mm -hmm. People want to help you. Beautiful sentiments. And folks, if you want to spend some time well, check out the Soul Rising podcast. And Jenny, Amanda, thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having thank us. Thank you so much for having us. We hope that you'll join us on yeah. our podcast. Yes. I love it.